this is a this is an, uh, another module in our uh, our beginning farmer resources uh, on beef production. Today we're going to be talking about nutrition and the basics of nutrition. Again, a very complex uh, topic, but we will move through it uh, uh, and give you an introduction into the very most basics of how uh, nutrition works for our, our beef cows. Now, if you think when you think about nutritional management, it is uh, critical to the health and productivity of your cows. Um, it's, it's difficult though because grazing animals, they go out, they gather their own feed, they choose what to eat, they swallow it, and we really don't know what they're eating. So trying to understand what they're eating is one of the biggest limitations that we have uh, in, in working with our, our cows and trying to provide proper nutrition. So to really develop the, uh, the proper level of nutrition for these animals, we need to go through several different uh, steps. We need to know the basic requirements of nutrients for the animals. We need to know how much they need of specific nutrients. We need to understand how many of those nutrients are in the feed resources that are available to them. And then we need to anticipate any shortfalls that we might think are going to occur. So uh, again, I'll, I'll go through this uh, in more detail, but we need to be thinking about what's likely to be deficient in their diet. We need to develop a supplementation program and, uh, and we need to use uh, nutritional monitoring then to make sure that it's working. So when we think about the important nutrients in the diet of an animal, this is really for all animals, uh, but for, for cows specifically here, the first thing we think about is dry matter or biomass. And this is not often listed as a nutrient, but it's to simply be sure that you understand that having enough to eat, having all they want to eat and adequate amounts is really the most important thing. So how much protein or energy is in the forage in the concentration is not that important uh, compared to how much of it they actually will eat. So, uh, so it, we'll come back to that, but dry matter biomass is important. The protein content is important, energy content, uh, minerals, and then finally water. We don't think about water often as a nutrient, but it is one of the most important nutrients and having clean uh, and available water at all times is important uh, for, uh, for these animals to uh, make their optimal production. Uh, a lot of words on this slide, but again, uh, hopefully you'll be able to study this and get, get some of these concepts, but protein is something that often is, is very often discussed and uh, it's important for you to understand that uh, we have several reasons that protein is required. One is as a nitrogen source for rumen fermentation. The cow uh, has a large fermentation vat where the grass that's gathered goes in there and it, it ferments and uh, produces uh, acids as well as bacterial growth and this uh, process requires nitrogen. So the first use of protein is simply for the nitrogen that is in it uh, is then uh, made available for these bacteria to grow in the rumen. There needs to be enough of this ruminally degradable protein uh, in the diet to uh, keep the ammonia level up in the rumen and, and make sure that those bacteria can grow and thrive. Um, then the microbial protein that is produced in the rumen is the key supply of actual amino acids to the animal. So, uh, we say, you know, we feed the bugs and the bugs feed the cow, and that's how it works. We, stuff that we feed to them goes in the room and it's broken down by these bacteria, and then the bacteria, uh, as well as protozoa and, and, and fungi as well that are in the room and pass down, and that's where the actual uh, amino acids available to the animal come from. There's another one you'll hear a lot about or, or might see mentioned called bypass protein or undegradable protein, and this is protein that escapes the rumen fermentation. Uh, it's got some characteristics that allows it to slip on out of the rumen without being broken down by the bacteria. And, uh, and it's sometimes uh, not enough of that in the diet, but it's really rare for beef cattle, mostly an issue for dairy cattle. Uh, we can also use a, co a compound called non-protein nitrogen or sources of nitrogen that are not protein, an example being urea. And that can be used directly to supplement nitrogen for that ruminally degradable uh, protein fraction that we need to keep those bacteria alive. They, they can use quite a bit of, uh, of urea or, or ammonia essentially as their nitrogen source. So sometimes we'll see that put into diets and it's commonly found in protein, uh, protein tubs that are those blue tubs that are a common cattle supplement. Heat uh, may damage the protein uh, as well and so if you think about hay 
If your hay uh, heats during uh, storage uh, after you've cut it, because it's baled too wet, it will damage the protein. So there is, uh, there is also not just uh, this degradable protein, but there's also protein that's damaged so much that it will never be degraded uh, and is not available to the animal. So the final concept with protein is that it's rarely the limiting factor in high quality grazed forages. So again, uh, we're focused here on local beef producers and um, that, uh, that protein is, is rarely going to be limiting if you're doing a good job with your forages uh, and, uh, and keeping them young and, and uh, uh, in a low stage of maturity for the animals. Uh, the next one being energy. Energy uh, is also, we sometimes think about that as calories. It's the very same kind of concept in, uh, in, in human nutrition as well. And in our, our beef cow nutrition, the thing to think about is that energy is inversely related to the level of fiber in a feed. So fiber does have calories. It is digested and, and in, oftentimes used for energy, but it's much lower uh, in energy than something like starch or sugars, something that, uh, that is uh, non-structural. So if we think about the fiber then, fiber uh, is a big part of our, our thinking about beef cattle nutrition. We need to understand it and, and how to measure it and that sort of thing. So what you'll often see is neutral detergent fiber NDF is reported. That's the total cell wall content, uh, and uh, and so the total structural carbohydrate, if you will, in the uh, in the plant, and um, that has an impact on how much of the feed the animal will eat. They can only consume so much fiber, and then they're restricted based on that. So extremely high fiber feeds. Uh, sometimes their in intake is restricted because they just can't eat that much fiber. The next type of fiber, acid detergent fiber, and this is, a, uh, this is just a system that was developed for analyzing fiber years ago, but acid detergent fiber, or ADF, uh, is, um, is parts of the cell. It, it, it really is the cellulose and the lignin, lignin being a completely indigestible part of the cell wall. And so this ADF is very indigestible, and so understanding its level, we can, all, we can have a good way of, of estimating how digestible the forage is going to be. The final one that you might see quite commonly on a feed tag, if you go into a, uh, into a feed store, would be crude fiber. And uh, crude fiber, unfortunately, is very outdated. It's an old system that's been, uh, been uh, not used at all in research or, uh, or in, in many ways uh, in many years, but it's still the one that is used in feed regulations. So just be aware that it's got some limitations, but it's still the higher the crude fiber, the lower the energy will be on most feeds. In beef cattle, we typically talk about two different types of way, uh, ways of expressing energy, one being total digestible nutrients, or TDN, uh, and that's usually estimated from how much fiber is in a, a forage or a feed. The other one is net energy, and net energy is a much better way of expressing energy, but it also is much more difficult to measure. So uh, we, for, for feeds where a whole lot of animals are fed that feed, things like corn silage, alfalfa, uh, corn, we understand the net energy values very well, but for, uh, for situations where we have very, uh, feeds that vary a lot in their quality and uh, there's not near as much research on them, then we just really don't have any data to calculate net energy. So for the most, you'll see things expressed as TDN or total digestible nutrients. Uh, in vitro or in situ digestibility are good in estimates of energy in forages. These are techniques that actually use rumen bacteria either in a test tube in the lab or actually by putting the feed in, a, in kind of like a, a Dacron tea bag in this rumen of the animal and getting an idea of how digestible that is. That's a really good estimate of energy and you'll see that sometimes available through advanced labs. And then the final concept is that fat, and we can feed a little bit of fat to animals, uh, to, 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 to cattle, not a lot, but we can feed a little bit, that has twice the energy of carbohydrates and so a little bit of fat goes a long way to uh, enhance the energy level of a diet. Uh, then we turn to minerals, and minerals are, uh, can be extremely complex, and, uh, but nevertheless, mineral supplementation is a key to forage supplementation program. There, there are many times you don't need protein or energy supplementation. You always need a mineral, and, uh, and I just can't stress that enough that Every, uh, every beef farm should have a mineral they're comfortable with and know how to manage it. 
Uh, that's because there are some minerals that are almost always deficient in our forages. Selenium, copper, for examples, those two are never high enough, and so you have to have some supplementation on the side. Uh, and when we think about minerals, and I'm not going to give them all to you, there's a lot of them, but these are the major ones that we think about, and the ones in red are the ones that are most likely to be deficient, and they're actually in this particular order. Uh, the major uh, minerals, these are minerals that are required at a fairly high level of the diet. Uh, they are salt, magnesium, calcium, phosphorus, potassium, and sulfur. And salt, mag, calcium, and phosphorus are the four that are likely to be deficient in some situations. Salt nearly always, phosphorus rarely. So as we go down there, they, they're less likely to be deficient. In terms of our trace minerals, copper, zinc, selenium, and iodine. Uh, uh, the first three, copper, zinc, selenium, being the ones most likely to be deficient, iodine often will be as well. Others, manganese, iron, uh, and, uh, and other minor ones are not, uh, are, are not as likely to be deficient. Now, one of the things about minerals that I want to stress, it can get really complicated because we do have like requirements for copper, for example. Uh, that we can look at in a table and we know that all things normal that would be the copper requirement. However, there are very complex interactions and if you look at the little diagram up on the top right of this slide, um, what you'll see is lines that interconnect uh, different minerals and each of those lines is a documented interaction with those other minerals. So some increase the digestibility of others, some decrease the digestibility, some um, interfere in, by making complexes, but nevertheless it's very, very difficult to, um, to uh, really purely figure out this mineral thing. It's, it's difficult, but uh, nevertheless we have good uh, standard guidelines that we've developed that do seem to work pretty well across our region. Uh, the bottom uh, picture there on the bottom right is a, an example of a mineral label and we'll look at one that's a little bit more visible later on. This is a, a typical type of product that again every farm should have one or more of these that they're comfortable with and that they use in their nutrition program. Now as we get in thinking about nutritional management it's important for us to understand there is a big range in nutritional requirements uh, among our animals uh, on, on, these, on these cattle farms. And some animals have very low nutrient requirements, some have very high nutrient requirements. And so we need to be, th this leads to some advanced management uh, practices that we need to be thinking about. But if we look at the lowest requirements, mature bulls, a male that is, 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 is grown and, and mature, that is perhaps just standing in a small pasture and not, not having to breed cows or do anything most of the year, they have very low requirements and they oftentimes can get fat just on the, the standard grass, uh, fescue or Bermuda grass that they have to graze uh, and, and we have to worry about them getting too fat, so something to think about. Dry cows are also have very low requirements, dry mature cows, uh, and by dry I mean they're not lactating, and again uh, that's, that's what that means. Uh, they don't, they're not giving milk, and uh, so they, they just have their body maintenance requirements are very low. Uh, next, lactating cows, once they do start milking, they have uh, uh, high requirements, and it's, it's especially from the time they calve through the time that they uh, are bred back with their next calf, uh, they, have, they have high requirements, and it's going to take medium quality or better forages to be able to meet their needs. Uh, the mature bulls and dry cows can be kept on low quality forages if, that's, uh, if they're in a hay feeding situation or something like that. Uh, weaned calves and yearlings are next. These have uh, higher requirements. That's either stocker cattle or developing replacement heifers or, uh, or if you're doing uh, beef, uh, your yearling animals that are, are, are growing and putting on frame and, uh, and muscle as well. The highest requirements are around weaning and then those drop off as we grow a little bit, especially in protein. But uh, we're going to take high quality forages or perhaps medium quality forages with uh, supplementation to be able to make adequate gains in, in that class of animals. Uh, finally, finishing uh, uh, is, the, is the highest requirement. Uh, if we're going to do a uh, all pa uh, you know, pasture based system, then we're going to have to have high quality forages uh, for our finishing animals. And, uh, we also might need to use concentrates at significant levels depending on how fat we want the animals and uh, how good the forage is that we have. But these, uh, these requirements range from 
uh, very low to, uh, to very high, and again, understanding that will help you uh, to develop your management system. This slide shows the, uh, the TDN and protein requirements along with milk production in a brood cow in her 12-month cycle. So uh, draw your attention first to the purple. That's the milk production, and you see that one month after uh, she's calved, uh, this, this being the numbers there are the num number of months since calving. Uh, one month after she's calved, she has, uh, is producing quite a bit of milk. Uh, she continues to increase milk production for a month and then it starts to drop back off, but she's producing milk for about six months uh, for, that, uh, for that calf that would be weaned typically between six and seven months of age. You can see that the TDN or the energy requirement follows that quite closely, uh, pretty high uh, when she's uh, calved and as long as she's milking, then it drops off at weaning. But then you see it starts to build back, it starts to increase again, and that is because this growing, uh, the, the growing calf inside the cow is starting to require nutrients, and as it grows, she'll have an increasing requirement. So uh, sometimes we see a requirement for a dry cow or a lactating cow, and it's important for us to realize this is changing all the time. This is a cycle, it's not just two different classes of animals. Uh, but certainly you can see also the protein in the blue, um, line there at the bottom is around 10, decreases maybe to about 7 and then back up to 10. So it's, it's, pretty, uh, uh, you know, it's pretty flat compared to the energy um, curve. Now again, don't want to um, just spend time reading you numbers here, but for your information, uh, these are some of the, uh, the, the protein, TDN, calcium, and phosphorus requirements for different groups of animals. Uh, and you can see those same concepts I talked about on the earlier uh, uh, the earlier slides uh, with the movement in crude protein and TDN requirement uh, as the animals start lactating uh, and then also with the higher faster growing animals having higher requirements. Uh, note along the, uh, the, the left hand, the first column is the dry matter intake in percent of body weight and I want to spend a minute talking about that. The best way to estimate how much an animal needs to eat is to understand their body weight and then do a, a calculate a, based on a percentage of that. So we typically, for dry cows, we think about 2% of body weight. So let's think about how that fits. A 1,200 pound cow then would need 24 pounds of dry matter intake. And that's a key concept. Uh, animals will be limited to about 2.5% of their body weight is about as much as they will eat of a forage-based diet. And, uh, and so you're just limited with that. You have to get the nutrition that you want packed into that amount of feed. Uh, and, and that's a, a key concept that you need to uh, be keeping in your mind. Now we move to typical forage uh, nutritive values. And uh, I've put the cow, the lactating cow there uh, along the top line just uh, for reference. But if you look at uh, the thing, the major points here, Bermuda hay and fescue hay are our two most common forages. Bermuda grass is going to be lower in energy, especially than fescue uh, uh, in hay because of the structure of the fiber. It's just a different type plant. Um, but the other thing I want to point out on this is that our grazed pasture, either uh, uh, like a cool season annual pasture or, or perennial pasture or stockpiled fescue winter grazing, uh, all th those are much higher in, uh, in nutrients than hay. And, uh, and so this is just because of the, the, the problems that occur during hay production. And so we need, uh, this is again the reason that we need to emphasize grazing rather than using hay. So now I want to talk uh, about nutritional management from here out and get some of those concepts in your mind. Um, we need to, um, uh, as we've st stated earlier, we need to optimize the value of forages and the use of forages in our system. We need to have an appropriate stocking rate so that there's plenty of available dry matter for the animals. Uh, again, having enough to eat is as important as having enough protein in what they eat. Um, we need to test our hay and understand the nutritive value of, of, of our growing forages so that we do have an idea of what might be deficient in our diets for our animals. We want to group animals according to their nutrient requirements. This is a key concept because we can't feed them uh, to meet their needs if they're all in one group but with low and high requirements. We need to develop an appropriate supplementation program and then we need to use uh, body condition scoring and potentially other indicators to assess the nutritional status of the animals. 
Now, so as we talk about forages, uh, I want to kind of go through some, some points about this. We want to uh, minimize our use of harvested forages. Again, uh, hay is extremely expensive because of the equipment that is required to, to make it. Uh, and hay is usually not that good a quality in our environment. We are, are because of the difficulty of cutting hay here, it's, it's damp, it's humid, it's hard to dry it. Uh, hay is typically not that good. And, and so uh, we need to, you know, that's why we need to really just not use any more hay than we have to. So if we stock appropriately and don't exceed our carrying capacity, uh, we can um, uh, have forage production on the farm that will feed all the animals during a normal year. And um, it, is, uh, it is critical that they have plenty of dry matter and they have all that they want to eat with some waste left over. So again, we're, we're, we're maximizing that intake. We also need to understand that it's, it, it's, it's easy to mix forages up and, and uh, minimize the need for supplementation. So if you do uh, test your forage as shown in uh, the middle picture here on this slide, uh, we can um, get a lot out of what we call hay targeting. In, in other words, using high quality hay for the ones that have high quality requirements, high requirements, and low quality hay for the ones with low requirements. If we test, we can strategically do that. And then we also can use uh, uh, strategic high quality forages that are put in the system and this would be something like uh, a winter annual or a summer annual that's planted specifically to fill a gap and to provide high quality forage and nutrition during a, uh, during a targeted uh, time. Those are quite expensive to grow and to put out but they may be the best way for you to manipulate the diet of the animal uh, in a given situation. Now on to the concept of animal grouping. Uh, as I said, uh, the, in, the animal requirements do differ quite a bit. Uh, things like mature versus young, lactating versus dry, light calves versus heavy calves, we already made those points. And so we need to make sure that we have animals in appropriate groups. So on a cow-calf farm, uh, we typically would have a group of mature cows. Uh, then we would have the young cows uh, would be in a separate herd. Developing heifers or growing heifers would be in one group. Uh, that finishers might also be in that group. We will have mature bulls and young bulls. And so on a small farm, you, you realize that this is a challenge. So uh, you, 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 that's a lot of groups of animals if you only have a few cows. And so uh, certainly we need to be thinking about how we can uh, make this more efficient. Perhaps you could put uh, your uh, young cows and developing heifers, finishers could be all in a, in a group that have similar requirements. Now, we, we do have a lot of interest in uh, mob, creating a mob or mob grazing. You hear that a lot. And so that's kind of the opposite from what I'm talking about. That's where you put everybody in one group and run the entire group through the farm uh, for grazing management purposes. And there are times that you can do that. This is, a, this is an example of, a, of what a mob situation might look like. Uh, and when the animals are, are, are all in a similar uh, uh, you know, all in their lowest nutrient requirements, that's probably the best time to do it. So dry cows, when you don't have calves on the cows, they could be all put together with your finishers and your growers, and then they could be mobbed through. But for the most part, we don't want to do that year round. We're going to have to have uh, uh, the ability to strategically provide nutrition to these animals that have higher requirements. So um, you can, you don't have to work out this mob thing. A lot of people like to do that for three or four months out of the year to get the good animal impact and then divide them back out for calving and, uh, and, and manage them uh, more closely at that time. Now, <clears throat> the next concept is nutritional monitoring. And this is something that, um, that you can do all you want to create a good nutrition program. Go through all that, study the requirements, find out what your forages have in them, put it together, but you need to have some way of knowing if it's working. And so you have to have this concept of monitoring. The first being very short-term things that you notice. So this is just every day when you go out. Animals uh, will tell you when they're hungry or not. And sometimes they try to trick you, but you, so you need to go out there, but this top picture uh, on this slide. These cows are very content looking. I'm obviously standing there with a camera and if they were hungry they would be looking differently. They would be looking at me. They would be uh, mooing, vocalizing. They'd be moving towards the end of the pasture where they thought the grass was going to be given to them next, that sort of thing. So you can really tell from their behavior if they're hungry and, and, and keeping, I'll just say hungry cows cause problems. So 
keeping the animals well fed and with grass in front of them all the time is important. The second one is fill, and this is shown in the bottom two um, pictures. Um, the fill means how much feed is actually in the rumen of the animal. The rumen lies there on the left side of the body, and so where you see the yellow circles, that's a, called a little tri that's the triangle uh, between the, um, the, 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 the pelvis and the ribs. And when the rumen is full, that protrudes, and when the rumen is empty, that shrinks down. You see that triangle shape. So the cow on the left is what we would call empty. She's hungry. The cow on the right, where it's, it's more ballooned out there, she's got adequate fill. And they, uh, these, uh, the, the, the same thing that causes this look also impacts stretch receptors in the rumen and gives them this, this um, feeling of being full or being hungry. So we need to make sure that we don't let these cattle get empty all the time. Um, right above them, the last thing I'll say, fecal consistency. You can get some indication of the nutrition of a cow from the fecal consistency. The one on the left there being stacked up pretty high means it has a lot of fiber in it. It's a very low quality feed. On the right, that one's one we would call ideal. Uh, spreads out uh, like kind of like a pancake, has a little dimple typically in the middle of it, and uh, you can kind of tell a little bit about their digestive health and the diet of the animal by looking at fecal consistency. So those, those three, all those pictures are what you would look at in the short term. Now in the intermediate term, we use something called body condition scoring, and I'm going to talk in detail about it, so I'm going to put it off to the next slide. But what we're trying to get at is the long-term indicators. How much did they gain? Did the cows breed back? Did we make money? And, uh, and that's important to monitor those things, but it's too late to do anything about it until the next time around. So we want these sh short-term and intermediate things so that we have a good idea that we are going to get the cows bred, that they are going to gain well. If we let them go empty day after day after day and we see body condition scoring slim slipping, is a really good chance they're not gaining. We don't, have to, we don't have to weigh them to know that. So we need to use these, we need to use these intermediate things so that we can, um, we can meet the, the requirements and come out with the long-term indicators that we're, that we're hoping for. So body condition scoring is a very important system for uh, our smaller producers. And uh, you, know, you could have a scale and weigh the animals and get some information like that. And I would encourage you, if you're getting in the beef business, to get you a set of scales so you know how your animals are gaining. But the nutritional uh, status of a cow can be monitored quite well using a visual body condition scoring system. And so this particular diagram shows a cow and shows the areas on the body that you look for, for fat across the back and the brisket, across the ribs, uh, what we call the hooks and pins that are the, the, the front and the back of the pelvis, and then around the tail head. And so if we can uh, look at a cow and, and, and understand what we're looking at, we can, we can determine her nutritional status. Now, we use a one to nine system in beef cattle where one to three is extremely thin, uh, four to six is moderate, and seven to nine is fat. And so if you're a beginner at this, think about it as three scores, thin, moderate, fat. And then the number scores are just simply divisions of that. So uh, I encourage you to go and start looking at cows and thinking about what the body condition is. Ideally at calving, we'll have a cow at a six. At breeding, she will lose some condition perhaps because of her milk, but we don't want her to get thinner than a five. At the end of breeding, uh, we, can, uh, we can like to see them gain a little bit of weight during the breeding season. That's not required, but can help. And, uh, and then uh, back to five by weaning. Uh, during, uh, for growing animals, these are, our, are like our finishers. We want them to be about a five and a half. And then for finishers to decide how well finished an animal is, we again use body condition scoring for that. So uh, we want an animal to be a six to seven, uh, perhaps an average of six and a half uh, to be considered to be finished. And so this is an important thing for all of us to, to study and to, to do better at. And just to think about it, a gain of one condition score on a typical brood cow is about 100 pounds of body weight. And so that's a lot of fat, and, and uh, it takes quite a long time to move from one body condition score uh, to the next. Now, why is body condition important? Um, we, do, um, uh, we do understand, uh, like even in humans, body fat affects reproduction. And 
And if you're too thin, uh, you know, uh, it, the, the body doesn't work properly. So, uh, so we know that um, body condition scoring is an estimate of body fat. That's what it is. And it's important to the reproductive success of a cow. She needs to be fat enough to give the signals that, her, that she's of the nutritional status to have another baby. And then also for meat quality in our finishers, that's really important as well. So it's important for us to understand that an animal, a cow has to breed back in 82 days after she has a baby to stay on an annual cycle for a one year interval between calves and that's our goal. So we just don't have that much time to get that done. The little yellow um, on the left hand side, the yellow figure uh, shows the number of days between the day the cow calves and the day that, the, uh, that she's cycles or that she comes back into heat to ready to breed again. And for body condition score three, you see it takes 89 days. This is a research-based information. A body condition score four takes seven days. So if you've got a bunch of threes and fours, it's going to take about an average of 80 days for them to come back and, 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 and cycle the first time. And as we said, we want with 82 days is when we got to get her pregnant. So if you're in that category, these animals are going to be more than a year between calves. Once we get to a body condition score of five and six, it only takes about 50 uh, to 60 days for that uh, animal to come back to her first cycle. And so she then has that cycle and the next cycle to, uh, to breed back to keep on her year, uh, her year um, cycle. So, uh, so again, think about that, fives and sixes, uh, if they're at that when they calve, then they will be much more likely to breed back and stay on, the, on a normal cycle. Uh, the next, the, the, the bar graph in the center shows uh, pregnancy rates in cows that were three, four, five, or six, and you can see that that just increases as we go, but getting up to a five, we got up near 90% uh, uh, pregnancy rate, and that's what our goal is. So we'll, we'll talk more about that during the reproduction module. But, uh, but certainly here, uh, we do know that, um, that it will impact reproduction. Now, just to get you thinking about how to look at cows, we'll run through a grouping of, uh, of photos here, and I'll run through these quite quickly. But a three, you see very sharp ribs. You see a very sharp backbone, and one of the characteristics of a three is you can look at the backbone and see the individual bumps, the individual vertebrae along the top of the back. Uh, this cow is thinner than a cow should ever get. Uh, when you have cows like this, uh, you need to get them separated from the herd, feed them differently. Uh, if, if, if all of the cows are in good shape and you got one like this, there's a chance she's sick, has got no teeth, or has some other problem, so taking care of that will be important. But that's a three, and she's very much in danger of not breeding back, having another baby, and uh, it's not going to be uh, good for anybody. Uh, a number four is not that different from the three, but you don't, you start to see a lot less sharp ribs, sharp backbone, you don't see the, the individual bumps on the backbone, uh, but still too thin and, uh, uh, and we, should, we should prevent cows from getting this thin. Uh, this is another four as well, and the point of this one is that if they have a lot of hair on them, sometimes it obstructs the way that you look at them. Uh, this cow, if you felt her, you'd feel she has a sharp backbone and sharp ribs, but, uh, but the hair kind of is covering that up. So we need to be thinking about that, and, and it's always a good idea to put your hands on them as you're learning body condition scoring so that you don't get fooled by these cows that carry a lot of hair. A five now starts to take on a little bit smoother look. You still see a few ribs. You can see the point of the hip uh, around the tail head. It's not either uh, doesn't look fat or thin, either one. A little bit of fat in the brisket, but not very much. But this is a five, very acceptable body condition uh, for a mature cow, uh, especially in this case, uh, this, this one's a dry cow. Another look at a five, and just a point here, some cows, they, they just look different, you know? So you have to individualize this for each animal, but again, I think some of the same characteristics, some fat cover uh, over the animal, but not a lot, and, uh, and that, uh, that's, that's basically a five. Now when we get to a six, we get a more smooth look. We start to get uh, less visual ribs, start to get a little bit fullness around the tail head, a little bit in the brisket. And uh, this, this is, a, if you think about beef production uh, and local beef production, this is an animal here that's getting close to being finished. So, uh, so we, want to, um, we want to start training our eye to this fat look. 
Uh, here's another six, a cow that has a little bit more around the tail head perhaps than the last cow, but uh, nevertheless you can still see some, uh, see the hip, see some uh, protrusion of, of boniness and not that much in the brisket. So a six, and then a seven, and this is probably, I've been told this is probably a high seven, but um, uh, you know, I, um, I think she's kind of a moderate seven, but you see a lot of fat around the tail head, no um, ribs present, uh, very flat across the back. And again, if this was a growing animal, that's what you're starting to look for to get them finished. You, you want them fat. And so uh, this is as fat as a brood cow should, should ever get. Uh, anything fatter than this probably is not producing enough milk or maybe skipped a calf or has some other problems and you need to work on that. Now, as we think about uh, kind of these types of systems, every now and then you go out and you find something like this and uh, this particular cow is, a, I don't know what you call her, she's probably a 10 or 11. So anytime you have a one to nine system, uh, you'll be, uh, you know, you'll, you'll have some examples of where one just doesn't quite fit, but certainly um, just an oddity, but you, you can have some pretty much extremes in this system. Now, I want to, the last segment of the talk here uh, on nutrition is to talk about uh, supplementation programs, which are very important in terms of fine-tuning your nutrition. So we want to be aware that um, there, are, uh, there are definitely problems with some of our, uh, our, our nutrients, sometimes energy, oftentimes energy is deficient, protein is rarely deficient, but then minerals are, are often deficient, copper, zinc, uh, and selenium. Uh, are, are, are issues that we have to deal with in almost all farms. So if you look at the, uh, the, the two pictures to the right, these are actually from two different cases that I worked earlier in my career where both of these were mineral deficiencies. The, it was extremely good grass, everything was working well on the farm, but both the sets of animals were very unthrifty looking, very rough hair coats, uh, very, uh, just, just didn't look like they felt good, didn't, weren't doing well. And we documented in both of those cases mineral deficiencies. And when the farmer started using a good mineral supplement that was formulated to meet their needs, uh, this problem went away within a few months. And so again, a very strong encouragement of you to have a good, strong mineral program. Now, if we think about uh, how to do the mineral supplementation programs, I, I, I'll say it again, we all should have a good, pro, a good mineral program. And uh, we need to make sure that we get enough mineral into the animals. Most of the mineral supplements on the market are made for a four ounce per head per day intake. And that's about two, two pounds per cow per week. So the problem with minerals is they're put out free choice. The animal gets all that they want. And we have to make sure that they're eating the amount that they're supposed to get. They are designed for a certain intake, but we have some things we can do to manage around that and encourage you to learn more about those. Uh, we, did, we should shop for our minerals and get something that meets the needs from our farm. And again, beginning producers, this is where you should ask for help. Your extension agent, your veterinarian, or an advisor uh, could help you to develop a good mineral program. And I would suggest getting that help uh, uh, and, and then um, having an effective program that way. We need to be thinking about things like copper. Do we need extra copper? Do we have phosphorus? Um, deficiency on our farm or perhaps we use poultry litter and we don't have a phosphorus problem. And then grass tetany is a, is a disease that we'll talk about in the health module, but grass tetany is caused by lush grass and, uh, and is a, a magnesium deficiency essentially or magnesium supplementation can prevent it. So oftentimes we'll use a high mag mineral. We also need to find a good feeder that will keep the mineral dry and, uh, and in good order, that the animals won't turn over, that they won't damage over time. And so on this, these pictures are two examples. The one on the bottom is the one that I prefer, and there is a YouTube video on this uh, that can be, uh, link can be found on the CEPHS website, or, uh, or you can just Google uh, cattle mineral feeder on, on YouTube, and you'll find an instructional video on how to build that one. That's, that's the one that I most strongly advise uh, in, in our program. Now just a, a little bit about reading a mineral tag. Again, uh, a difficult concept for beginning producers, but we do need to make sure that uh, when we go shopping for a mineral that we don't just have somebody in the store say, oh yeah, this is what you need, just believe me. You know, you, you got to shop for these things. So we do have uh, the recommendations for a high mag mineral are listed here. 
quite a bit of range in some of those. Uh, as I said, we need to know how much you need, but these are our standards. And we can go to the label on the, uh, the mineral tag of what we're looking at, and we can compare the calcium level, the phosphorus level. Uh, for example, if we look at this one, it has 1,200 parts per million copper. Our suggestion is 1,300 parts per million. Well, I would not probably reject this mineral supplement because it's 100 lower than our recommendation. Uh, but if it was 200, I would say, well, that one doesn't have enough. So we need to be uh, shopping these and, as I said, getting with somebody that really sort of understands uh, and can help you look at your options would be advisable. So if you're developing a mineral program, what I would suggest you do is go to your feed stores or different mineral suppliers and get an example of their labels and then go to your extension agent or your veterinarian and sit down with them and just decide which one meets your needs best. And they will have access to kind of what the requirements are for the cow, what the recommendations are for different type minerals, and it can help you to choose the best one. Now we'll also uh, need at times to feed energy or protein, and, uh, and that's, uh, that's gonna be important for, um, for, for situations where we are trying to get advanced production on the animals and, and the forages are, are, are falling short. So we need to be making sure that this is guided by our forage analysis. And that's because these supplements are expensive. We don't want to feed them if they're not needed. And uh, sometimes that can, be, uh, that can be the case. So uh, one thing to think about is convenience is important. And we do <clears throat> see small producers using a lot of uh, convenience type products, what we call licks or blocks or tubs. Uh, and uh, and they, uh, that's uh, real common. And we just need to make sure that you understand that you're always better off to hand feed a supplement in a feed bunk to animals rather than letting them get their own from a free choice type product. Uh, we do have a lot of byproducts out there that work well for supplementing cows and, and for our feeder cattle, uh, our, our finishers. And uh, I would like to uh, raise your interest in whole cottonseed. Whole cottonseed is probably the most um, uh, efficient and inexpensive supplement that we have here for brood cows. And if you're in the cotton producing areas of the state, I'd strongly improve, uh, suggest you look into that. And part of the benefit of that is that there's a lot of fat in cottonseed and so fat feeding uh, add a little bit of 4% uh, 4, 4 of the diet, which is not important that you know that detail, but it may uh, improve the reproduction of cows. And so some fat from cottonseed is, is quite beneficial. So in this, uh, this, this picture shows the different ways this could be done. The blue tub there is a typical way that we buy these. Uh, we call them a poured tub or uh, there's, there's different types out there, but in general, those are quite expensive and they give you a little bit of extra nutrition, uh, are, are better than nothing perhaps, but may, uh, may not fit the need in most all situations. We can feed on the ground uh, certain supplements. This should be avoided in most cases, but whole cottonseed as shown in this picture of cows is being put under a, a poly wire or a temporary fence and is a really efficient way of, uh, of getting uh, supplemental nutrients into the cattle. There also are a product called range cubes that can be purchased that are designed for feeding right on the ground. Um, but most concentrates or feed mixes need to be fed in a feed bunk of some kind. And, and on the bottom left there, there's a group of replacement heifers uh, that have just calved and they're being fed a grain concentrate out of a feeder, uh, out of a feed trough. And it's important that we have enough space that they can all eat at the same time. But hand feeding these animals has a big benefit uh, on their behavior. They get to know you, they, they get used to being close to you, they realize that you bring them something good, and so uh, there's some behavioral modification from hand feeding that we really like that you don't get when you uh, use the convenience free choice supplements that uh, like shown with that blue tub. Okay, so the last word here then, uh, yeah, as we get into this, we need to use good feeding management. So you can formulate again, do all these parts of your program and have it all together and then, and then mess it up in the end because you don't use good management. So we need to minimize feed wastage. Hay needs to be put in a feeder, not put up directly on the ground as shown in one of these pictures. We need to make sure we have adequate feeder space, both for cows eating hay or for calves eating out of a feed bunk. We don't want to let the cows get hungry. I said earlier, a hungry cow is a cow looking to get in trouble. And if you 
Uh, you know, you need them to stay in the pasture and, and do what you want, but if they're hungry, they're going to be looking for ways to get out and ways to cause you trouble. They're going to be hollering and all kinds of stuff. So keep them, keep them, uh, keep them full. Avoid a, a condition we call round bale syndrome. Let me mention that just for a minute. Here we see on the bottom right a cow eating out of a round bale ring. And if we take a, a group of cows and we put out one hay bale a day, one round bale a day, and they all stand around that ring eating, not all of them can eat at the same time. The timid cows, the weak cows, are going to get less feed than the ones that are more aggressive. And over time, that, that most timid cow can lose weight and get in really bad condition while the others look fine. We see this every winter. And again, it's just a matter of putting out more hay than the cows need to eat for the whole day. Put out two hay feeders and put out two bales at a time instead of one if that's all they need. So just some simple things like that will help you. We do want to balance rations. And as a beginning producer, I encourage you to get with a, an advisor that has some training in this to help, help you go through those, uh, those thought, that thought process. Learn about body condition scoring and monitor it uh, throughout. Every time you look at the cows, think about body condition. And as I said uh, in an earlier presentation, at some point you'll be, you'll be seeing body condition without having to look at the individual cows, and that's really important. Also, as, I, as you go out and you work with be very observant and adapt. If it's not working the way that you think it should, if some cows are not responding, try to figure out what's going on and change your management. Don't be hung up on doing it one way all the time. 